Uh, you've uh, recorded an uh, episode of Steering Into the Iceberg on your Common Sense program. Yeah. That has started a lot of conversations. It was quite moving. It was quite haunting. Got me a lot of angry emails. Really? Of course. I did something I haven't done in 30 years. I endorsed a political candidate from one of the two main parties, and there were a lot of disillusioned people because of that. I, I guess I didn't hear it as an endorsement. I just heard it as a, the similar flavor of conversation as you have in, in uh, hardcore history. It's almost the speaking about modern times in the same voice as you speak about when you talk about history. Hmm. So it was just a, a little bit of a haunting view of the world today. I know we were just wearing our doom doom <laughs> caster. Have me put that right back on, are you? <laughs> no, the the uh, I like the term doom caster. Uh, is is there is there um, how do we uh, get love to win? What's the way out of this? Is there some hopeful line that we can walk to to, uh, to avoid? something, and I hate to use the terminology, but something that looks like a civil war. Not necessarily a war of force, but a, a, a division to a level where it doesn't any longer feel like a United States of America with an emphasis on United. Is, is there a way out? I read a book a while back. I want to say George Friedman, the Stratfor guy, wrote it. It was something called The Next Hundred Years, I think it was called. And I remember thinking, um, I didn't agree with any of it. And one of the things I think he said in the book was that, you know, the United States was going to break up. I'm going from memory here. He might not have said that at all, but something was stuck in my memory about that. And I remember thinking, um, hmm. but I, I think some of the arguments were connected to the differences that we had and the fact that those differences are being exploited. So we talked about mm -hmm. media earlier and the lack of truth and everything. We have a media climate that is incentivized to take the wedges in our society and make them wider. And there's no countervailing force to do the opposite or to help to, you know, so um, there was a famous uh, memo from a group called Project for a New American Century. And they took it down, but the Wayback Machine online still has it. And it happened before 9-11, spawned all kinds of conspiracy theories because it was saying something to the effect of, uh, and I'm really paraphrasing here, but you know that, uh, that the United States needs another Pearl Harbor type event because those galvanize a country that without those kinds of events periodically is naturally geared towards pulling itself apart. And it's those periodic events that act as the countervailing force that otherwise is not there. Um, if that's true, then we are naturally inclined towards pulling ourselves apart. So to have a media um, environment that makes money off widening those divisions, uh, which we do. I mean, I was in talk radio and and it it has those people, the people that used to scream at me because I wouldn't do it. But I mean, we would have these terrible conversations after every broadcast where I'd be in there with the program director and they're yelling at me about Heat, heat was the word. They create more heat. Well, what is heat, right? Heat yeah. is division, right? And they want the heat not because they're political. They're not Republicans or they, or Democrats either. They're we want listeners and we want engagement and involvement. And because of the constructs of the format, you don't have a lot of time to get it. So you can't have me giving you like on a podcast an hour and a half or two hours where we build a logical argument and you're with me the whole way. Mm -hmm. Your audience is changing every 15 minutes. So whatever points you make to create interest and intrigue and engagement have to be knee jerk right now. Things They told me once that the audience has to know where you stand on every single issue within five minutes of turning on your show. In other words, you have to be part of a, of a linear set of political beliefs so that if you feel A about subject A, then you must feel D about subject D. And I don't even need to hear your opinion on it because if you feel that way about A, you're going to feel that way about D. This is a system that is designed to pull us apart for profit, but not because they want to pull us apart, right? It's a byproduct of the profit. That's one little example 
of of 50 examples in our society that work in that same fashion. So what that project for a new American century document was saying is that we're naturally inclined towards disunity and without things to occasionally ratchet the unity back up again so that we can start from the baseline again and then pull ourselves apart till the next Pearl Harbor, that you'll pull yourself apart, which I think was think that's what the George Friedman book was saying that I disagreed with so much at the time. Um, So in answer to your question about civil wars, we can't have the same kind of civil war because we don't have a geographical division that's as clear cut as the one we had before, right? You had a basically north-south line and some border states. It was set up for that kind of a split. Now we're divided within communities, within families, within gerrymandered voting districts and precincts, right? So you can't disengage We're stuck with each other. So if there's a civil war now, for lack of a better word, what it might seem like is the late 1960s, early 1970s, where you had Mm -hmm. the bombings and, you know, let's call it domestic terrorism and things like that, because that, that would seem to be something that, once again, you don't even need a large chunk of the country pulling apart. 10% of people who think right. it's it's the end times can do the damage, just like we talked about terrorism before, and a can of gas and a Bic lighter. I've lived in a bunch of places, and I won't give anybody ideas, where a can of gas and a Bic lighter would take a thousand houses down before you could blink, yeah. right? Um, that terrorist doesn't have to be from the Middle East, doesn't have to have some sort of a fundamentalist religious agenda. It could just be somebody really pissed off about the election results. So once again, if we're playing an odds game here, everybody has to behave for this to work right. Only a few people have to misbehave for this thing to go sideways. And remember, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So you don't even have to have those people doing all these things. All they have to do is start Start a tit-for-tat retribution cycle. And there's an escalation. Yes. And it go and it creates a momentum of its own, which leads fundamentally, if you follow the chain of events down there, to some form of dictatorial government as the only way to create stability. Right? You want to destroy the republic and have a dictator? That's how you do. It. And there are parallels to Nazi Germany, the burning of the Reichstag. You know, blah blah blah. And some, I mean, I'm the doomcaster again, aren't I? <laughs> well, and some of it could be manufactured by the, those seeking authoritarian Absolutely. power. Absolutely, oh, like the Reichstag fire was. Yeah. Or the Polish soldiers that fired over the border before right. the invasion in 1939. Uh, to fight the uh, the devil's advocate with an angel's advocate, uh, I would say, just as our conversation about Elon, it feels like individuals have power to unite us, to, to be that force of unity. So uh, you mentioned the media. I think you're one of the great podcasters in history. Joe Rogan is a like a long form, whatever. It's not podcasting. It's actually whatever the, uh, whatever the yeah. very infrequent is what it is, no matter what it is. <laughs> but it, the basic process of it is you go deep and you stay deep and the listener stays with you for a long time. So I, I'm just looking at the numbers. Like we're almost three hours in. And I, uh, from previous episodes, I can tell you that about 300,000 people are still listening to the sound of our voice three hours in. So usually it's 300 to 500,000 people listen and they tune up. Congratulations, by the way, that's wonderful. Joe Rogan is what, like 10 times that. And so he has power to unite. Uh, You have power to unite. There's a few people with voices that it feels like they have power to unite. Even if you, if you quote unquote endorse a candidate and so on, there's still, it feels to me that speaking of, I don't wanna keep saying love, but it's love and maybe unity more practically speaking that like sanity, that like respect for those you don't agree with or don't understand uh, so empathy, well, th- just a few voices of those can help us avoid the, really importantly, not avoid the singular events, like you said, of somebody starting a fire and so on, but avoid the escalation of it, the preparedness of the populace to escalate w- those events, to, to, yeah, to, to turn a singular event and a single riot or a shooting 
or like even something much more dramatic than that to turn that into something that creates like ripples that grow as opposed to ripples that fade away. And so like, I would like to put responsibility on somebody like you <laughs> and uh, well, me in some small way and Joe being cognizant of the fact that a lot of very destructive things might happen in November. And a few voices can save us is the feeling I have. Not by saying who you should vote for or any of that kind of stuff, but really by being the 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 voice of calm that like calms the the seas from or whatever the analogy is from boiling up. Because I, I, I truly am worried about this is the first time this year when I I sometimes I, I somehow have felt that the American project will go on forever. That when I came to this country, I just believed, and I, I still think I'm young, but like, you know, I have a dream of creating a company that will do a lot of good for the world. And I thought that America is the beacon of hope for the world in the, the ideas of freedom, but also the idea of empowering companies that can do some good for the world. And I'm just worried about this America that filled me a kid that came from, our family came from nothing and from, you know, Russia as it was, Soviet Union as it was, to be able to do anything in this new country. I'm just worried about it. And it feels like a few people can still keep this project going. Like people like Elon, people like Joe. Uh, is there, <laughs> uh, do you have a bit of that hope? I'm watching this experiment with social media right now. And I don't even mean social media, really expand that out to, um, I mean, I feel like we're all guinea pigs right now watching, you know, I have two kids and in just watching, and there's a three year space between the two of them. One's 18, the other's 15. And just, you know, in, in when I was a kid, a person who was 18 and 15 would not be that different. Just three years difference, more maturity. And stuff. But their life experiences, you would easily classify those two people as being in the same generation. Now, because of the speed of technological change, there is a vast difference between my 18-year-old and my 15-year-old, and, and not in a maturity question, just in what apps they use, how they relate to each other, how they deal with their peers, uh, their social skills, all those kinds of things where you turn around and go, this is uncharted territory. We've never been here. So it's going to be interesting to see what effect that has on society. Now, as that relates to your question, the most upsetting part about all that is reading how people treat each other online. And you know, there's lots of theories about this. The fact that some of it is just for trolling laughs, that some of it is just people are not interacting face to face, so they feel free to treat each other that way. Um, and I, of course, I'm trying to figure out how, how if, if this is how we have always been as people, right? We've always been this way, but we've never had the means to post our feelings publicly about it. Or if the environment and the social media and everything else has provided a change and changed us into something else. Um, either way, when one reads how we treat one another and the horrible things we say about one another online, which seems like it shouldn't be that big of a deal, they're just words, but they have a cumulative effect. I mean, when you, uh, I was reading um, uh, Meghan Markle who I don't know a lot about because it's it's too much of the pop side of culture for me to pay a lot. But I read a story the other day where she was talking about the abuse she took online and how incredibly overwhelming it was and how many people were doing it. And you think to yourself, okay, this is something that people who are in positions of what you were discussing earlier never had to deal with. Let me ask you something. And boy, this is the ultimate doomcaster thing of all time to say. When you think of historical figures that push things like love and peace and, um, and, and creating bridges between enemies. When you think of how, what happened to those people, first of all, they're very dangerous. Every society in the world has a better time, easier time dealing with violence and things like that than they do nonviolence. Nonviolence is really difficult for governments to deal with, for example. What happens to Gandhi and Jesus and Martin Luther King. And you think about all those people, right? 
when they're that day, it's, it's, it's ironic, isn't it? That these people who push for peaceful solutions are so often killed, but it's because they're effective. And when they're killed, the effectiveness is diminished. Why are they killed? Because they're effective. And, and the only way to stop them is to eliminate them because they're charismatic leaders who don't come around every day. And if you eliminate them from the scene, the odds are you're not going to get another one for a while. I guess what I'm saying is the very things you're talking about, which would have the effect you think it would, right? They would destabilize systems in a way that most of us would consider positive, but those systems have a way of protecting themselves, right? Hmm. And and yes. so I, I feel like history shows, see, history is pretty pessimistic, I think, by and large. Um, if only because we can find so many examples that just sound pessimistic. But I feel like people who are dangerous to the way things are tend to be removed. Yes. But there's two things to say. I feel like you're right that history, I feel like the ripples that love leaves in history are less obvious to detect, but are actually more transformational. Like, in well, one could make a case about, I mean, if you want to talk about the, the long-term value of a Jesus, a Gandhi, yes. Bar, but yeah, yes, those people's ripples are still affecting yes. people today. I agree with and you. And that's, you feel those ripples through the general improvement of the quality of life that we see in, in throughout the generations. Like, the, you feel the yeah, ripples okay. through I'll the- I'll go along with you on that. Okay. okay. But I would, even if that's not true, now, <laughs> I tend to believe- that and by the way, the the company that I'm working on is a competitor is exactly attacking this, which is a competitor to Twitter. I think I can build a better Twitter as a first step. There's a long story in there. I think a three year old child could build a better. <laughs> and that this is not to denigrate you. I'm sure yours would be better than yes. a three year old. But <laughs> Twitter is so. And listen, Facebook too. They're they're really awful platforms for intellectual discussion and meaningful discussion. But when, and I'm on it, so let me just say I'm part of the problem. We're new to this, so it's not. It wasn't obvious at the time how Agreed. to do it. It's now, you, and now a three year old can, can I do. It. I I tend to believe that we live in a time where the tools that people that are interested in providing love, like the the weapons of love, are much more powerful. So, like, the one nice thing about technology is it allows anyone to build a company that's more powerful than any government. So that could be very destructive, but it could be also very positive. And that's, I tend to believe that somebody like Elon that wants to do good for the world, somebody like me and many like me could have more power than any one government. To, uh, and by power, I mean the power to affect change. Which is what different do do, from what do you Gandhi. Do with government, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'll forget my train of thought. I'm getting yes. old. But yeah. I mean, how do you deal with the fact that already governments who are afraid of this are walling off their own internet systems as a way to create firewalls simply to prevent you from doing what you're talking about? In other words, if you know, there's an old line that if voting really changed anything, they'd never allow it. Mm -hmm. If if love through a modern day successor to Twitter would really do what you want it to do. And this would destabilize governments. Do you think that governments would, would take countermeasures to squash that love before it got too dangerous? There's several answers. One, first of all, I don't actually, to push back on something you said earlier, I don't think love is as much of an enemy of the state as, as one would think. Different states have different views. <laughs> I, I think the states want power, and I don't always think that love is in tension with power. Like I think, and 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 I think it's not just about love; it's about rationality, it's reason, it's empathy, all of those things. I don't necessarily think they're always in, have to be, by definition, in conflict with each other. So that's one sense. Is I feel like. Basically, you can Trojan horse love into <laughs> behind, behind uh, but you have to be good at it. This is the thing, is you have to be conscious of the way these states think. So the fact that China bans certain services and so on, that means the, the companies weren't eloquent, whoever the companies are, weren't actually good at infiltrating. Like... <laughs> I think, isn't that a song? Like, love is a battlefield. I think it's all a game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's all a game, and you have to be good at the game. And 
just like Elon, we said, you know, with Tesla and uh, saving uh, the environment. I mean, th that's not just by getting on a stage and saying it's important to save the environment. It's by building a product that people can't help but love. And then convincing Hollywood stars to love it. Like there's there's a game to be played. Okay, so let me let me build on that because I, I think there's a way to see this. I think you're right. And so uh, it, it has to do with a story about the 1960s. Uh, in the vast scheme of things, the 1960s looks like a, a, a revival of neo-romantic ideas, right? Uh, I had a buddy of mine several years, well, two decades older than I was, who was uh, in the 60s, went to the protest, did all those kind of things. And we were talking about it and I was romanticizing it. He said, don't romanticize it. He goes, let me tell you, most of the people that went to those protests and did all those things, all they were there was to meet girls and have a good time. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't so, but it became in vogue to have all, in other words, let's talk about your empathy and love. You're never going to, in my opinion, grab that great mass of people that are only in it for the, their interest in whatever it were. But if meeting girls for a young teenage guy requires you to feign empathy, requires you to read deeper subjects because that's what people are into, you can almost, as, as a silly way to be trendy, you could make maybe empathy trendy yep. love trendy solutions that that are the opposite of that um uh, the kind of things that people inherently will not put up with you in other words the possibility exists to change the zeitgeist yes. and reorient it in a way that even if most of the people aren't serious about it the results are the same does that make sense absolutely okay okay so we've found a meeting of the minds yeah we meet, uh, yeah exactly <laughs> creating creating incentives that uh, that encourage the best and the most beautiful aspects of human nature. Our will. <laughs> it all boils down to meeting girls and boys. <laughs> listen, listen. Once again, you're getting to the bottom of the evolutionary motivations, and you're always on safe ground when you do that. <laughs> yeah. 